um, to learn about OSHA's new major electronic record keeping rule which was issued earlier this year. We wanted to hold this webinar so that you understand what your obligations are under the new rule and in addition to the electronic submission of your injury and illness records to OSHA um, starting next year on an annual basis, the final rule also includes new policies regarding anti-retaliation, post-injury drug testing, safety incentive programs, and executive compensation and bonus programs. We are fortunate to have two OSHA expert presenters to discuss the scope and practical impact of this new rule. And our panelists include Eric Kahn, who is the founding partner at the law firm of Kahn Maciel Carey, where he represents employers during inspections and enforcement actions involving um, OSHA, EPA, as well as state and local state agencies. Um, also joining um, Eric is Kate McMahon. She's a partner um, at the firm, and she's practiced um, occupational safety and health and environmental law for over 20 years. So I'm going to turn it over to them now. Thank you again for taking time out to participate in AFS's webinar today. Thank you, uh, Stephanie, for the invitation and for the nice introduction. We're delighted to join uh, AFS today to talk about some very interesting OSHA issues, or at least they're interesting to us as big OSHA nerds. Um, I know everybody is surely in the mood, uh, in election mode right now, and, and probably uh, took in those bizarre, if not uh, very interesting debates. So we thought we would do the presentation today kind of in the style of a presidential debate. And of course, by that, I mean we'll uh, interrupt each other continuously, be very insulting, and not really answer any of your questions. Uh, but uh, with that, let's, let's talk about uh, our topic today. Uh, we're going to be talking about OSHA's new electronic record keeping rule. Um, and that electronic record keeping rule, we've got the, the title here, Pizza Parties, Drug Tests, and Injury Data. And that is really, you know, a, a mention to what Stephanie was talking about, the anti-retaliation elements uh, of the rule. So we're going to cover uh, in the rule the injury data submission requirements. Uh, that's sort of stage one, which is really what the rule was all about when it was first introduced throughout the rulemaking process. It was all about um, who is going to be required to proactively submit injury data to OSHA and what's OSHA going to do with it. Um, and there, part two, is the publication of employers' injury data. So we'll talk about what OSHA does plan to do with that data. But as the rulemaking progressed, a, a, an additional element surfaced uh, that is perhaps even more troubling to employers than uh, how the injury data is going to be used. And that's these new anti-retaliation elements. And under that header of anti-retaliation will be a discussion about post-injury drug testing, safety incentive programs, and executive compensation. So that's what we're going to talk about today, and I'm going to hand it over to Kate to talk about the electronic data submission elements of the rule. Good afternoon, everyone. Good to, good to talk to you all. Uh, so I, I, I have undoubtedly, I think, the easier part of this discussion, although I think we will sort of um, uh, talk about both of these topics jointly. Uh, but let me at least start with this um, electronic record-keeping portion of the rule, which is the portion, as Eric mentioned, it was sort of the guts of this rule until it essentially got overwhelmed by the anti-retaliation portion of the rule. Um, but still, this is an important part of the rule to understand. So let me go through what the new requirements of the rule are. And let me just say, you know, by way of introduction, that this, this new rule uh, really is a major departure from the historic uh, OSHA log process whereby companies, employers were required to keep log injury and illness data, but keep it for themselves, for themselves, for their own use in their own company. This is the first time since 1971 when the rule was promulgated, uh, right at the outset of the um, creation of the agency, that this data has to go wholesale for many, many, many employers across the nation to OSHA and then will be publicized. So let me tell you about the specifics. As many of you know, um, in May 2012, uh, November, November 2013, OSHA pro, uh, proposed this rule. And in sort of OSHA time, um, lickety split, the rule was finalized really within a couple of years time period, which is uh, almost unprecedented for OSHA. 
so we now are dealing with a final rule that was promulgated in 2016, this past spring, and what the effective date is January 2017. So the rule goes into effect this coming year. Um, the major provisions of the electronic record keeping portion of the rule include those that you see on your screen right now. Two things. One, employers that have establishments of 250 employees or more must annually submit to the agency their 300 logs, their 300A annual summary reports, and their 301 incident reports. In addition, those establishments, those industries that have establishments with 20 or more employees, which are in high hazard industries, are required to annually submit their 300A annual summary reports. Um, now let's talk, before we talk about your industry specifically, let's talk about how you do this count. Because obviously the 250 and the 20 threshold employee count is critical to determining whether you fall within or outside the scope of this electronic rulemaking, I mean electronic record keeping requirement. The total employees at the workplace at peak employment during the calendar year is the relevant number. Okay, so this is the most conservative approach that could be taken. You look at your peak employment time, and so 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 uh, once the rule goes into effect, you're looking at the previous calendar year. All right, so in 2017, you look back at 2016, you identify your peak employment period, and you include in that analysis any and all part-time employees, seasonal employees, temporary employees. So if you have a big job and you brought on a bunch of temporary employees, even for a period of, say, three months over the summer, or, uh, you know, if you've got, you guys probably don't have seasonal work, but if you do, you have to include those seasonal employees, and you do have to include your part-time employees. All right, so those are the numbers that are relevant to determining whether you're in the 250 count or the tw and the 20 count. And by the way, we're going to talk in a minute about high hazard industry and how your industry sector unfortunately falls within that high hazard classification. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, second key point to consider when you're doing this analysis of whether you fall within this um, the thresholds here for electronic record keeping is you look at the establishment to make this determination. So this is not a company-wide analysis. This is an establishment by establishment analysis. And an establishment means essentially, you know, a single physical location. So if you have, if your company has, let's say, five plants spread across five, you know, five different states in the country, each of those locations or establishments has to do this, this analysis to determine whether you fall within the 250 or the, the 20 count. The, the rule of thumb that I've been using when I advise my clients about this is to think about it is to tie the analysis to your 300 logs themselves. So if you have a separate 300 log for a unique location, then that is an establishment and the number of employees that are linked to that 300 log or to that 300A annual summary when you assess the number of work hours at that location, which employees are you counting? And you should be counting all of the employees, all of the workers who you are supervising on a day-to-day -day basis. That's why we talk about temps um, and part-time employees here. If you are supervising their work on a day-to-day -day basis, you're responsible to record their injuries, you're responsible to report their injuries, and that is a person that counts towards this 20 to 249 or 250 plus uh, trigger under the new uh, data submission rule. Okay. Um. So, okay, so as we said, location by location assessment, um, employee count at each location. Uh, now let's talk about the high hazard industry analysis um, that m must, be done, must be done. Here it's easy. Um, you guys, the foundries fall within the manufacturing industry sector, which has been identified as the two-digit NAICS under OSHA's Appendix A to this rule. 
that means that you guys' foundries are in as high hazard industries. Um, now, you still have to do your 20 count to see if you have 20 or more employees at any particular foundry. Um, but if you do, then you're within category two that's covered under this rule. Just uh, as a uh, you know, as an aside and by way of background, OSHA there was a lot of fighting in the rulemaking process about how this high hazard industry category was to be defined. Um, ultimately, where OSHA ended up, I think, was they looked at um, they looked back at Bureau of Labor Statistics data on DART rates. Um, so they looked at an average three-year period DART rate from 2011, 12, and 13, and industry sectors or industry groups that fell over a DART rate of 2.0, I think is where they ended up. 1.8, I think. Oh, uh, 1.8. Okay. Um, oh, no, 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 it was 2.0. You're they, right. They ended up at 2.0. At 2 um, fell within or, or met OSHA's definition of high hazard. So that's how you got to where you know where you're included in this rule, and the, the 1.8 is in my mind because 1.8 is the national average across all industries for DART yeah. rate, yeah. and so the idea that 2.0, which is within the margin of error, is basically average, and OSHA is identifying high hazard industries as those that are essentially perfectly average from an industry standpoint. And just one thing or two things to clarify on this front: one is that there the industry. Um, the, uh, the industry classification, the NAICS code, the high hazard industry, doesn't matter at all for workplaces in that 250 plus category. Yeah. If you're 250 or plus workers at an establishment, it could be in the least hazardous industry in the country, and it is still um, the, uh, the, the data submission requirement kicks in. And then the other thing is that there may be different NAICS codes applicable to your different establishments. So if you have a headquarters location that does no manufacturing at all, is just office workers, and that is you know 150 employees, uh, you may be able to not submit the injury data for that location if it is a separately designated NAICS code for that location. So a couple of uh, interesting uh, uh, you know sub issues within this uh, within this element of the rule. And I know your NAICS codes pretty well, and you know I think for all your manufacturer foundry, you know, sort of the essence of your of the work you guys do at the foundry, those facilities are all going to fall within high hazard industry. But you will be able to get some out, like Eric said, if you have like a corporate, you know, mm -hmm. corporate facility. Um, okay, so now let me talk about, oh, and look, just one more point on this, just so we don't create any or confusion or we, we resolve any confusion you guys might have. You've got these two categories, right? 250 uh, and up and high hazard industry. Since you're in the high hazard industry, um, you still need to do your count because if you're over 250, you're going to have to submit different documents than if you're just in the high hazard industry and have 20 to 249 employees. And I'll talk in a minute about what has to be submitted if you're 250 or more versus you're, uh, you know, being just in this rule because of the high hazard uh, NAICS code. Uh, okay, so what happens here if you're in, let's be, and you are essentially, um, uh, you have to submit your We've got a slide in here with deadlines. Nothing kicks in. The first submission isn't until this summer. So. I'll talk about what you have to submit, but where it's going is to this this portal that is being created by the agency that will be available to upload your data to. All right, um, uh, you know this submission can come from anywhere. It can come from your headquarters, or, or it can come from the individual establishments, um, but it must be identified by establishment.
sortable, filterable, uh, exportable, uh, anything that they can do to make it easier to be used by those who would intend to do you harm with this data. Uh, and it will be published without context. And when we say there, we mean you know some of the absurdities that result in a recordable injury uh, don't show up on the log. You know somebody is injured because of you know egregious employee misconduct, but it's a work-related injury. It goes on the log, and generally there's not an explanation that this was caused by employee misconduct. And in one of these sort of classic uh, OSHA shoots itself in the foot scenarios. Uh, it was either the same day or within two days of each other publishing this final rule in the Federal Register. OSHA also issued an interpretation letter that said it doesn't matter if you demonstrate that an employee was drunk or high at the time of the injury and being drunk or high absolutely caused the injury. If it's work related, it's still recordable. And that's going to go on here sort of as a ding against you uh, whether you could have done anything about that or not. So, so, you know, to step back here for a second, the whole point, as uh, many of you probably know, the whole point of these injury and illness logs, the record keeping rule, was to allow companies to have a place where they compiled this data so they could use it to help, you know, improve safety at their own facilities. Then they are useful tools to be used by, you know, you guys to, to sort out where injuries are occurring. But as Eric points out, and as Dr. Michaels points out, um, you know, he wants to use this to publish it to the world to pressure you or to nudge companies to, towards a better, safer workplace. But the record keeping rule was designed to be a no-fault rule. And this essentially turns that premise, you know, upside down. Um, it turns it on its head. It may, what, what Dr. Michaels is saying is that, this rule should be used to pressure companies if they've got high injury and illness rates. That means they're unsafe places, and uh, you know we're going to put competitor pressure on you. We're going to here, you know, we've got a slide which shows some of the the adverse impacts of publishing this data. Consumers who are doing business with you are going to be, you know, aware that you've got a injury and illness rate that um, maybe through no fault of your own make it look like your facility is not doing well in the safety world. And so, you know, there'll be pressure to not buy contracting companies. Um, you know, you may have problems with union campaigns. Uh, anyway, there's a whole slew of negatives that are actually by design supposed to work, according to Dr. Michaels, to sort of pressure you away from uh, or to pressure you to do better in your uh, injury and illness uh, situations at your workplaces. Key deadlines. Okay, so this chart, if you look on the left, you see the years we've got. The first data year that's ever going to be publicized is this year, 2016. And if you look on the very right side, the deadline, you'll see that's July 1st, 2017. All right? Um, the two middle rows or columns show you which category of employers have to submit what. So if you're in the if you fall within the group of employers that have 250 or more employees, you have to, next July, this coming July 2017, submit your 300A annual summary report. If you fall within the 20 to 249 high hazard industries, which most of you will, um, you have to submit your 300A. All right? But all, everyone's submitting just the 300A this first year. However, after that, notice what changes. In 2000, for 2017 data submitted in 2000, July 2018, those establishments with 250 or more employees have to submit not only their 300 A's, but their 300 logs and their 301 incident reports. The agency has, you know, has done this analysis to say that it'll take about 10 minutes to, you know, to create your account, 10 minutes to load up your 300 A's, and about 12 minutes for every injury and illness log that you have to, uh, you know, you have to add to the portal, including the 300. That's probably a really low estimate, but that gives you some gauge of what the agency thinks in terms of the amount of time to comply with this rule. And I think that, you know, that certainly depends on whether you already have moved to an electronic record-keeping system. And right now, you know, who knows what record-keeping systems out there will actually interface with OSHA's portal, because they haven't even finished building the portal yet, 
but I think that is one of the recommendations we will have ultimately is to move your record keeping to an electronic system, but don't do it yet because let's wait and make sure that whichever one you invest in is one that uh, interfaces with OSHA's portal when that time comes. So that is really the, the key issues on the um, electronic data submission side of the rule. Um, one of the things that was really fascinating about this rulemaking was <clears throat> that almost across the board, you know, pro-labor, pro-management side comments to this rule spoke out and said, hey, if you publish this data online, you're going to create a, a, a powerful force to discourage recording and reporting and to just under-record and under-report whatever reports you get from your employees. And so don't publish it online was the message that you're creating this negative incentive that if, you know, the consumer population and employee population is going to use this against you or plaintiff's attorneys or banks or insurance companies are going to use the data against you, people are going to cheat. They're either going to pressure their employees to not report injuries or they're just not going to record them and submit them to you, OSHA. So um, it, for the first time I can really remember, OSHA reopened a rulemaking record and we all celebrated as OSHA defense lawyers that finally the agency is listening to us. We told them how broken their rule is and they're going to go in and fix it and say we're not going to publish the data or you don't have to submit the data or whatever it is. But ultimately that's not what the agency did. Instead, they, they implemented a bunch of new punitive elements for doing the very thing that their rule creates an incentive to do. So that was their way of fixing this problem. And that hence was born these new anti-retaliation elements. So under this rule, employers are required to do three things. First, they are required to inform, not train, but inform employees of a right to report workplace injuries. And then more importantly, they're required to inform employees that their right to report work-related injuries shall be free from discrimination or retaliation. And so the way to accomplish it, the easiest way to accomplish this is by posting the newest version of OSHA's, uh, you know, OSHA's rights poster. Uh, you should already have this in all of your workplaces, but there is no requirement to have the most recent version, which I believe is a 2015 version. But the difference between the 15 version and the prior version, which was, I think, 2012, is that they added those specific words, that your right to report uh, work-related injuries uh, is a right that is free from discrimination or retaliation. If you post that poster, you have accomplished these requirements of the standard. If you don't feel like updating the poster, and by the way, it's free, you can just go on OSHA's website and print it, but if you don't feel like posting that, then you can inform employees any number of ways. You could send around a company-wide email. You could post some other information about this on a, a bulletin board where employee notices are typically posted. You could conduct a training program, uh, have it as a topic in a you know weekly safety meeting, monthly safety meeting, whatever. Your obligation is just to inform employees of this right. Uh, and then sort of the more controversial component of this is that OSHA has made it a regulatory requirement that employers not implement unreasonable internal injury reporting policies. And that is the sum and substance of what the rule says. Uh, you've heard, I'm sure, and you know, we've set up this discussion to be about drug testing and safety incentive programs and executive compensation. Those words appear nowhere in the standard. The standard just talks about ensuring that employers provide uh, injury reporting policies that are reasonable or they do not have unreasonable elements. And OSHA, through the preamble to the rule, um, as well as through various public statements over the course of the Obama administration, either in congressional testimony, in studies that they commissioned, in memos that they wrote about the VPP program, have expressed their view of what they consider to be unreasonable reporting requirements. And that's where we discern uh, and that our, our, our our, you know, our guess as to what OSHA meant by that was confirmed by recent guidance they put out about this rule, but that's where we learn that what OSHA means by unreasonable reporting policies, and they say are policies that may discourage an employee from reporting an injury and illness, that that includes things like post-injury drug testing uh, and, uh, and other elements I'll talk about here in a moment. The one thing that's really kind of interesting about this whole discussion is that it has always been unlawful to discriminate or retaliate against an employee for reporting 
a work-related injury. Reporting a work-related injury is a protected safety action, and the OSH Act itself, the legislation, has made it unlawful to retaliate against someone who takes a protected safety action. What is different and unique now is that this is built into an OSHA regulation. It is a regulation that prohibits you from having unreasonable reporting policies. So that means that OSHA can come in and enforce this, you know, essentially whistleblower uh, or, or rule without a whistleblower. There may not be a single employee who has ever claimed that he felt discouraged from reporting an injury or any employee who feels like he was retaliated against for reporting an injury, but you could still receive an OSHA citation because it is a new regulatory requirement. So what, what does OSHA mean by unreasonable reporting policy? They just issued a guidance memo about two weeks ago that tried to provide a little bit of detail around the incredibly vague language of the standard. Uh, and in the memo, they, OSHA provides some examples of what they consider to be reasonable injury reporting policies, reasonable drug testing policies, and reasonable safety incentive programs. And by that, we can figure out what are unreasonable programs, those that are prohibited. Right. And that's what we'll talk about. Right, right. So OSHA has basically said that employers may be cited for implementing reporting policies that have a perceived retaliatory effect for reporting workplace injuries. And they start with the actual policy for reporting itself, and OSHA has taken issue with and say that they will scrutinize policies that result in discipline for a late injury reporting and discipline for violating vague safety rules. So in this context, and we've seen OSHA do this in the 11C context, where an employer has a policy that says you must report work-related injuries within 24 hours. An employee got a bad cut on his finger or a, a moderate cut on his finger, didn't think it was so serious that he had to report it to his uh, employer, went home, didn't say anything. The next day, it started to get infected. He still didn't really say anything. The infection got worse, so he finally went and sought medical treatment and by the time he did, the finger had to be amputated. And the employer disciplined the employee for not timely reporting the injury, in which case it could have prevented, you know, taking an injury from a, a first aid incident to an amputation. That could have been avoided. Instead, OSHA got the employees back and said, no, we think you're only disciplining for late um, reporting to discourage employees from reporting injuries generally. So, you know, we all looked at this and said that that's crazy. Uh, what is reasonable? If a 24-hour reporting rule when an injury goes from a first aid case to an amputation is not reasonable, what's reasonable? So OSHA clarified that really what they're focused on here are those cases, and I think they consider that cut finger case to be one of them, where the employee does not realize right away that it is a serious enough injury to report. And that you can, as an employer, have a rule that says, report within 24 hours or report as soon as practicable, but it has to be that the trigger for when as soon as practicable begins or when 24 hour begins is after a reasonable employee realizes that they have a reportable injury. So if you are just disciplining employees for reporting in 24 hours and one minute without context, uh, that's going to receive a lot of scrutiny, but if you account for, you know, slow latency periods uh, or, you know, minor injuries to become serious enough to become aware that it is reportable, uh, then that would be an appropriate time limit for reporting. And this is relevant, I think, in particular. I mean, this cut example is a real one that Eric's talking about, but in particular, I think this is going to come into play, uh, into play with, like, ergonomic type injuries, back strains, pains, that sort of thing, that someone pulls something, they don't quite realize the significance of it, potentially anyway, but after some time period passes, it continues to bother them or it gets worse. And then they realize, oh, this is probably because when I lifted that patient or, you know, pulled that bar or whatever at work last week, um, I, I pulled something. And so this, is, this part of OSHA's guidance is designed to allow for and encourage and facilitate those uh, reporting uh, in, you know, injuries that late without being disciplined. And then with respect to discipline for violating safety rules, I, you know, when I saw that this was part of the preamble, I got very concerned and I talked to my friends at OSHA about this and said, you cannot take away safety discipline from employers 
you know, arsenal. That is the best way to ensure compliance with your safety policies. And OSHA clarified in their guidance that you absolutely can still enforce your safety policies with discipline. What OSHA will be looking for is consistency. So if you only discipline employees for violating safety rules, especially really generic ones like working safely or maintaining good situational awareness, if you only discipline after someone has reported an injury, you are likely to, to run afoul of this uh, regulation. But if you are enforcing it consistently, when there's, you know, when there hasn't been injuries, uh, then, then you can likely uh, you know, avoid violation in this context. Drug testing is the second big category uh, that uh, OSHA has focused on in the context of unreasonable reporting policies. And OSHA says that if your drug testing policy may tend to dissuade a reasonable employee from reporting a work-related injury because of invasion of privacy concerns, that that would be considered an unreasonable reporting policy. And the way this plays out in OSHA's mind is, you know, you threaten to drug test any employee who reports an injury, it is effectively a form of punishment for getting injured or reporting the injury more importantly. And that if an employee knows that he will test positive for drugs or alcohol, uh, then he will just keep the injury to himself and you don't have to put it on your log. Uh, I, I think this is an incredibly dangerous policy by OSHA, especially as we read story after story about a, you know, an epidemic of opioid abuse in this country uh, to take away a drug testing you know, tool from employers is pretty irresponsible from OSHA. So they tried through the recent guidance to define uh, really what they mean here. And they have clarified that really they're only focused on blanket post-injury drug testing policies. That you can still do pre-employment drug testing, random drug testing. You can test to comply with other state or federal laws like DOT if you have commercial drivers. DOT mandates post-accident testing. So if you're testing in that context, obviously you wouldn't violate uh, this regulation. Um, you would not violate this regulation if you test in the context of a workers' compensation requirement, either you know, a state workers' comp law requirement to test or if you participate in a premium reduction policy where you're required to test all injuries, uh, employees who report all injuries to get that premium reduction. Uh, and then finally, there is still some post-injury drug testing that is still allowed, and the key is OSHA's analysis is based on whether you're testing to determine the root cause of the incident as opposed to testing essentially to punish the employee. Um, and so it, the key here also is that you do not have to have probable cause to believe that that employee was high or drunk when that accident occurred. It's just that it is the type of injury for which you know motor skill being affected by drugs or alcohol could contribute to an accident. So a, a forklift uh, accident you know, any type of forklift accident testing would be appropriate. Uh, a musculoskeletal disorder um, uh, issue would, uh, would not be. Um, that was just a signal that I've run to the end of the time I'm supposed to use here. So I'm going to move and just cover one last topic, uh, and we'll open it up to some questions. Um, the, the OSHA did give one really good example of the critique they would give of a drug testing issue, where if you have a crane operator, uh, who is carrying a load, another employee who rigs the load to the crane, another employee who's flagging and directing the crane operator, and in the process of that work, the load falls and injures another separate employee who's working nearby. If you drug test only the employee who was injured, who had nothing to do really with the crane operation itself, OSHA is going to see that that is really testing uh, is, is a form of punishment. But if you, as a consistent approach, test the crane operator, the flagger, and the rigger, that that would be an acceptable form of post-incident drug testing. The last big issue that OSHA has focused on is safety incentive programs. And this also drew a lot of ire from industry uh, and really from employees who love these types of programs. And OSHA has endeavored to clarify that they're not saying all incentive programs are unlawful, but only those that are linked to the absence of injury. And the concept is, if you reward or punish based on the absence of injury or injury rate, uh, then that can create a chilling effect uh, and discourage employees from reporting an injury. And the example that OSHA gives all the time, and I just I think that they would, they're doing themselves a disservice when they do this, is they talk about the pizza party. 
that employers are out there, you know, daring to offer a slice of pizza to their employees if they go six months without a reportable lost time injury, uh, that that creates such a disincentive for employees to report their injuries to employers because they may lose a slice of pizza or cost their coworkers a slice of pizza. I just think is, um, you know, a real lack of knowledge of how the workplace works and how employees work. Uh, but that is the approach that OSHA has taken, that if you provide any form of bonus, pizza party, safety bingo, gift cards, uh, cash compensation, you know, actual, you know, bonus in your compensation for an employee or an employee group for having no injuries over a certain period of time, that would be essentially de facto unlawful under this regulation. Uh, however, if you wanted to reward sort of leading metrics, um, you know, leading safety indicators, uh, that would be perfectly fine. So if you wanted to provide a pizza party or a raffle or some benefit to employees or an employee group who are audited for a month and no one is found to be violating their PPE uh, requirements, that would be perfectly acceptable. Providing bonuses for employees observed working safely or those who report an unsafe condition or if a crew completes all of its required training on time or for the individuals who volunteer to serve on a safety committee. All of that can be recorded, rewarded, but if you are just rewarding, you know, meeting, uh, getting below a dart rate or having fewer recordable injuries or no recordable injuries, that that would be a violation because it creates this um, disincentive to report injuries. So essentially it's, you know, in, in essence, it's leading versus lagging factors. So if you incent based, if your reward is based on leading factors, then it generally it's extremely likely to be sanctioned to be allowed by OSHA. If it's based on lagging factors, then it's extremely likely to be determined to be violative of this rule. Right. And then and so the last two bullets on this slide really go to that management and executive compensation. And what we have seen OSHA express publicly on this issue is that the closer the manager is to the actual employees doing the work, the more likely he is to be able to influence the reporting environment. And therefore, for those workers, your frontline supervisors, your plant manager, your site safety manager, if their annual compensation or bonuses are tied to injury rate or the absence of injury or meeting a certain dart rate metric or something like that, that those are likely to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis to be unlawful, unreasonable reporting policies. However, the further you get away from employees, you know, regional managers, corporate safety directors, senior executives, that OSHA believes that those, those individuals further removed from the actual workers uh, do not have a, such an ability to affect the reporting atmosphere on the ground that their, their compensation and their bonuses can factor in injury rates, but further down the ladder, they cannot. Um, so what's happening with this rule? Uh, Kay talked about the implementation dates for the actual electronic data recording. This rule, the anti-retaliation elements, were supposed to go into effect back in August, and OSHA said, yeah, we're going to defer this on our own accord to November 1st to give us, OSHA, more time to produce some guidance for the industry to understand what's required and what's prohibited. That November 1st date was just called into question because industry filed a lawsuit. Uh, and they filed a lawsuit in the district court in Texas challenging specifically the anti-retaliation provisions and saying, you know, OSHA has not done sufficient analysis to show that this is necessary or that the uh, rule itself will drive the result that OSHA expects to, uh, to result from this. Uh, and the plaintiffs, the industry groups, moved for a preliminary injunction to block OSHA from enforcing these anti-retaliation elements until the district court could rule on the overall legality of the rule. Uh, OSHA opposed this injunction, and I thought this was one of the most fascinating things I've ever seen. OSHA said, don't grant the preliminary injunction, because one of the elements of a preliminary injunction is that the plaintiffs must show that they will be irreparably harmed if we enforce this rule. And OSHA said, the industry cannot show that there will be irreparable harm because nobody has any idea what the law prohibits or requires. Because until we put out guidance, no one can know what they're actually required to do. 
And I just couldn't believe that OSHA is basically saying, our rule is so poorly written that you have no idea what you're required or prohibited from doing that you can't show harm. To me, that shows that the rule is unlawful and uh, did not meet the requirements of the APA, but that was OSHA's defense against the preliminary injunction. In any event, the judge, uh, not quite ready to rule by November 1st, asked OSHA, didn't order them, but asked them to please move the effective date back to December 1st. For just for now, remember, we're just talking about the anti-retaliation provisions of the rule. Right. The rest of the rule is going to go in, in effect, as I said earlier, you know, in January and then uh, by July next year. Right. So just these internal reporting policies, drug testing, safety incentive, push that date back to December 1st so that I, the judge, can have a little bit more briefing on the issue and can have a little bit more time to decide whether to issue this preliminary injunction. So OSHA agreed to do that. They pushed it back to December 1st. The judge, I am very confident, will issue a ruling on this this month, sometime before December 1st. And I think the fact that he asked for this additional month is, uh, is a good sign for industry because if he really wasn't concerned about this or didn't think there was really a good basis for irreparable harm, he would not have asked, for, he would have let OSHA start enforcing it and then rule on the preliminary injunction later. But the idea that he pushed it back is a pretty good sign. So what should employers do now? Um, you want to talk a little bit about the record keeping stuff and I'll talk about the retaliation stuff? Sure. So basically, just in a nutshell, I mean, just you know, get things ship shape. I mean, these records are now going to be available to OSHA and the world. OSHA will use them uh, to, they say, to target compliance assistant efforts and enforcement efforts. So make sure your logs are done well. Um, make sure you tr go ahead. Uh, we recommend retraining the people who are doing the logs so they know, you know, what injuries are recordable and what injuries are not. One thing to keep note of is many, many companies have historically erred on the side of caution and over-reporting because, you know, it's helpful. Even if it doesn't necessarily by law have to be on your log, it might be helpful to you guys internally to know that this particular incident happened. Well, you know, probably it is not a good idea to over-report anymore. Um, make sure you don't under-report, but to, to, Probably not a good idea to over-report. Um, and I, I'd, I'd recommend an annual audit of the record-keeping form. So between you know December 31st and the preparation of your 300A log, or certainly at least before you publish the data uh, to OSHA's uh, portal, have a third party take a look, or or a second you know second second party or third party audit to get a fresh set of eyes on these to see if there's anything that's on there that doesn't need to be on there, or things that you might have missed to make sure that you're accurate and not over-recording. You know, just one quick thing. We review these things all the time for companies who have, let's say, an OSHA inspection. The inspectors ask for the 300 logs, so we take a look at them to make sure they're good. And I cannot tell you, I mean, it's, you know, 90% of the logs we review cross industry have errors, mistakes, you know, uh, all kinds of stuff that we can catch. So. Your logs probably do too, so it's important to make sure you, you know, sort of really focus in uh, over the next six months on that, uh, on the log. Yeah, and, and, you know, also understand that this is, this creates a window for enforcement as well. OSHA is going to have your data, and they're going to see this, and they're going to say, my gosh, you know, company XYZ had a bunch of this type of injury, let's go start an inspection. So you want to make sure you're accurate because you don't want to invite an inspection where one doesn't belong. And you want to make sure you're accurate because we're going to see more enforcement tied to these logs going forward. So make sure that they're accurate and you're not setting yourself up for violations. In terms of the anti-retaliation stuff that we talked about, uh, you know, we still don't know whether the rule is going to go into effect in December or ever. Uh, but I still think it's a good idea right now, if you haven't already started, to go back and evaluate those policies to make sure they either comply right now with OSHA's intent or that you are ready to make the changes necessary to make sure that you comply with their intent if the rule does go into effect. I do recommend printing out the new version of the OSHA rights poster and publish that. Um, I, I would also suggest um, and post that, right? Uh, consider increasing random drug testing if you think that your post-injury drug testing is going to have to be reduced. And then finally, for heaven's sakes, hide those pizza boxes when OSHA shows up because there's nothing more nefarious than daring to provide pizza to your employees. So 
uh, that, that's our that's our spiel, and we'll open it up for any questions if, uh, if anybody has any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just an instruction to the audience, you can submit your questions uh, at this time using the chat feature or the question feature. Um, I'm looking at the chat windows and I don't see anything that's been submitted by chat. Um, so I will go ahead and read through some of the questions we have received. So the first question, what is the status of the Silica Rule Court Challenge? Um, I, I can go uh, ahead. Yeah. I can go ahead and answer that, Kate. Hey, this is Stephanie. Um, right now, we are in the process of preparing um, our brief with um, NAM. That is due on November 18th, um, and as well as the other groups that are challenging the rule, they're due um, on the 18th. OSHA, um, the Secretary of um, the Administrator of OSHA will then have an opportunity to submit a brief, then we'll get to do a response brief. So the timing, um, we'll be going back and forth through the briefing um, period through March of 2017. So we're not looking to a court date um, on the Silica Rule Challenge until probably um, the May-June time frame. And Stephanie, this is Kate, to add a, a little flavor for just generally how these things work. And as you know, Stephanie, after this briefing period, there will be oral arguments that Stephanie was referring to, and the parties will be able to orally argue before the, you know, before the circuit yes, court. And then, um, and then the court, you know, I mean, I don't know exactly what the average time is for a ruling. Um, there's, you know, a, a review of a whole lot of data that's put into the court via this joint appendix that will be submitted by the parties. And then, you know, within, I would say, I don't know, Stephanie, do you have a sense? I would guess within, you know, six to eight months, there's likely to be a ruling. Right. I mean, I just don't think we know at this time. We don't even know which judges are hearing the case um, at this time. But uh, obviously, it's a drawn-out period, and um, the effective date is June of 2018. Um, so we're, you know, obviously looking to get a response back from the court sooner <laughs> so that we understand what our obligations are moving forward. But um, our attorneys are working on our brief right now, and we'll be sharing that um, once we submit that on November 18th to the membership. Okay, so next question. Um, will workers' comp first report of injury be allowed in place of 301 as they are now? Yeah, great question. So the, the rule does not change in terms of what you're required to maintain, uh, and a, it's a 301 report or a comparable report. What's happening here, though, what's interesting is you're not going to be submitting your actual paper records. This is It's called the electronic record-keeping rule because it's really about data submission, not actual document submission. So what's going to happen is you're going to be submitting to OSHA the data that is required under the 301 report requirement. So that would be, you know, the, the supposed cause, uh, the tools or equipment that were involved, uh, you know, the, the cause analysis that you've done, uh, the basic uh, uh, detail about uh, medical treatment that was provided, all of the information that is on the 301 report or the workers' comp first report of injury or whatever alternative form you use, it's about plucking that required data out and entering it into this portal. That's one of the reasons why I think OSHA's view of uh, the burden on employers is absurd. You know, from a 300A standpoint, it, that might be right. If you have an electronic record-keeping system that interfaces right with OSHA's portal, it might be a click of a, a click of a button or a drag of a mouse to get the, the data over there. But from the standpoint of 301 incident reports, that's certainly not the case because it's a collection of data and narrative descriptions and things like that that I don't see how that's going to be a simple process at all. And if you're a large employer with you know 25, 55, 100 injuries in a calendar year, that's 25, 55, or 100 301 reports that are submitted, but it's not the report itself, it's the data from the report. So you're not going to be required to change how you do that, it's just a matter of extracting that data for submission to OSHA. 
Okay, next question. Um, this one's a little long. Uh, hopefully I'm, I read this correctly in a way that makes sense. Um, we current, okay, th the question is, we currently have a policy that applies discipline if any employee does not immediately report an injury. It is listed below. So are you saying we need to change it to read differently based on these new rules? Uh, 20, failure to report immediately to a supervisor any personal injury incurred during work hours and or on company premises. First offense is a reprimand. Second offense is one week layoff. Third offense is a discharge. So, yeah, so the way you read it, uh, what we heard are two important things. One, report immediately, and the second piece of it that's relevant is upon realization of the injury is that what you said well, so I don't think I don't think this rule includes that language that's what we would recommend I right. think you know I the, the immediately causes me a little bit of concern um, because it needs to be reasonable it needs to be practical um, you know as soon as practicable is language that OSHA said is acceptable as long as the triggering event is when the employee realizes that they have a reportable work-related injury uh, has has occurred I, I would, you know, I think there's two ways to address it. One is to address it in practice to be, you know, it's as soon as practicable after they realize, and you don't discipline if an employee doesn't realize right away that they've been injured. I think the better approach is to change the written policy to use some language like that, um, to, to, to tie the as soon as possible trigger or the immediate trigger although I don't like immediate either way, the as soon as possible trigger to when employees realize they have suffered a work-related injury. Something like that would be better from our perspective. So overall, I think what we're saying is the word immediate is going to be a red flag for OSHA, even if you add this language, you know, upon realization of the injury or whatever. Um, I understand how important it is to your company to encourage immediate reporting, and I think that when you speak to them and explain and do training on the reporting policies, you can still, you know, use that language as long as you make sure that you tie it and they understand, and they have to understand this. They have to understand that they won't get in trouble if they didn't report it immediately, as long as they report it promptly upon realizing they've had a, you know, an injury. And I, I hate saying that because to me that's bad safety advice. But if you're giving some discretion to the employee to judge how serious the injury is, you're going to have cases that get worse that don't need to get worse. So that's terrible safety advice. Uh, but that is the position that OSHA, I think, is staked out here pretty clearly that that's their intent. And, you know, uh, something else that I don't know that we mentioned explicitly, which is OSHA is going to, if, if in fact this portion of the rule is not enjoined uh, in, pursuant to this text Texas District Court, um, uh, you know, analysis of the preliminary injunction motion, then this is going to go in a, into effect on December 1st, and OSHA is going to be looking to enforce these provisions pretty quickly, I think. Um, the new administration will be in place by, you know, by February or March, and I suspect that they're going to. This is going to be one of the rules where we see some initial enforcement activity, uh, assuming it's a, a Clinton administration. And otherwise, this rule will be repealed, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> perhaps along with the entire agency. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, next question. We currently only drug test post injury. If it, if it is for anything other than bug bites, foreign body in the eye, or scrapes, does this meet the requirement? Uh, so there's one big category that that OSHA has focused on and has spoken publicly on that I think would still be a problem, and that would be your MSD injuries. If someone reports to you with you know carpal tunnel from working with a, a machine the same way for three years, that it would be hard for, for OSHA to understand why a drug test in that circumstance would be appropriate. Um, there probably are other categories that just generally would be a problem there, but the concept is that there must be some, some rational basis that the, uh, that the injury could have been caused by drug or alcohol use. Now, most injuries, when you think about it, you know, at least safety incidents, um, uh, it, you know, it's, I mean, I can think of a whole lot falling off, 
you know, off right. a roof, um, uh, you know, using your machine, of uh, putting your hand in where there's a guard, um, you know, lockout, tagout injuries. I can see how all those could be tied to drug use. You know, your head is not clear. You're making poor decisions. But OSHA is going to be looking carefully to see if there's a direct tie between, you know, sort of foggy brain and this incident. Yeah, or, or motor skill impairment. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, basically OSHA has tried to say, look, we're not trying to eliminate post-injury drug testing, but we're trying to eliminate it as a form of punishment. So another factor that they would consider is not only the circumstances you do it, but how consistently you do it for not only people who are not injured, injured but also people who were involved in incidents when they weren't injured, but when their involvement could have caused or contributed to the incident. That was the crane example we gave. If you're only testing the person who was injured, or as OSHA would say it, you're only testing the person who reported an injury, you're discouraging the reporting of injuries. But if you're testing consistently when there's been an incident that drugs or alcohol could have contributed to, that's okay. Okay, um, a, a note, I've gotten a couple of questions about receiving a recording and a copy of the PowerPoint slides. So the answer is yes, you will get it um, through the email address that you registered for this webinar under. Um, that should come in uh, 24 hours, I believe. And we did have, I had a technical issue with my audio going out briefly. I don't know if any of the attendees were affected by it, but it might affect the recording. So I apologize for that. Um, okay, moving on to the next uh, question. All right. Um, will workers' comp first report of injury be allowed? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm reading an old question. It must have gotten copied. Okay. Um, what if the injured employee tells a coworker that they think they hurt themselves but don't report to the company, then a day or two later, after they may be able to pass a drug test, report to the company that they hurt themselves two days ago? So, you know, I, the key there is whether, whether there's any, uh, whether you can demonstrate that the employee was aware of the injury immediately, you can enforce your time limit um, consistent with this regulation. So if you have a 24-hour reporting requirement or as soon as practical reporting requirement and there's no question that this injury was was immediately, it was immediate and immediately understood by the employee to be serious enough to report, and he doesn't report, you can enforce your policy. And that evidence that you're talking about where he tells a coworker that he injured himself, you know, working on this machine, certainly is, it has relevance in your, in any defense you would have to mount if OSHA found the, you know, the, uh, discipline that you issued to this employee to be uh, improper. And so in a lot of ways it will depend on the type of injury as well. I mean if it's an injury that you know you've got circumstantial evidence and it's the type of injury that might not have been perceived by the employee to be serious at first, you know, the coach is going to move the burden back to you and it'll be difficult. But if it's a plain sort of traumatic injury, uh, you know, he threw out, you know, dislocated his shoulder or he, uh, you know, got a bad, you know, a, a partial amputation or something like that, there's no question that the employee knew right away that this was reportable and if he doesn't meet your, your criteria, whatever it is, you can discipline. Okay, next question. Uh, this one's coming from Tom Slavin, who's actually our 10Q uh, Safety Committee Chair. He asks, if you use discretion for picking which injuries to do post-incident testing on, do you not open yourself up to charges of discrimination? I'm sorry, can you, can you repeat the first part of that? Sure. Um, if, you use dis if you use discretion for picking which injuries to do post-incident testing on, do you not open yourself up to charges of discrimination? So if you're choosing that's, that's which injuries. Right, that's a terrific question because, you know, OSHA is basically forcing you into the business of making that judgment, whereas right now a blanket testing policy, you know, has no potential to be applied uh, inconsistently, uh, but, you know, OSHA's view is that if you are testing every injury, a bee sting, uh, you know, allergic reaction to a bee sting, a musculoskeletal disorder, that it is 
that notion that every employee knows that if I report this injury, no matter what, I'm going to be drug tested, that that will discourage some employees from reporting injuries. And to me, I mean, there's only one type of employee that that discourages, and that's the employee who is drunk or high at work, uh, and I don't... <laughs> And I don't think they should be protected from, you know, uh, from, from being tested in those circumstances, but that is OSHA's view, that there must be some rational basis between the type of injury and the drug test uh, and the, the uh, decision to order a drug test. So I agree that it introduces discretion in a way that, you know, prior policy did not, but that is OSHA's view that uh, right now, testing no matter what is essentially a punishment for reporting. Okay, next question is, um, does OSHA consider drug testing on accident punitive if it doesn't result in termination, but if it results in entering into an employee assistant program for counseling? Well, another really good question. You know, the way, the way OSHA has spoken about this um, and, and, and there's not a direct answer to that in the guidance that they've issued, but my inference is that they, they have said that the concept of privacy is the reason why blanket post-incident drug testing policies are discouraged, uh, means that it's not necessarily about, you know, being terminated or suspended, but about just the idea of having to submit to a drug test at all because it, you know, is a violation of your privacy. Uh, unless there is a legitimate basis to believe that you caused the accident and your interest as the employer is about learning root causes and preventing accidents, that that's why you're doing the testing, that if there's not a link to identifying root cause, it doesn't matter whether there's an actual discipline because it's a violation of privacy in and of itself. That, that's my inference there, but OSHA has not spoken directly to that question, but a great question uh, that I would be happy to take to some of my contacts there uh, to, to see how they would handle that. Okay, thank you. Um, is there, okay, next question, is there an OSHA guidance to inspectors yet? Um, and he uses FIRMS, F-I-R-M, an acronym. Yeah, the, right, the Field Inspection Reference Manual. I think it's actually changed names lately. It's the Field Operations Manual. Uh, I, I think I don't think there, there's certainly nothing in the FOM yet about this anti-retaliation uh, elements. I would say the, the, the best guidance that's out there for inspectors is the guidance that uh, we referenced back here at, um, uh, uh, I think it was a memo that was issued, where is that, just a couple of weeks ago. October 19th. Uh, yeah, so this guidance document is, you know, a memo from the regional administrator uh, out to, I guess, to, the, to all the world, but this is guidance also to inspectors. Um, there's not, you know, there's not FAQs about this yet in the, um, uh, you know, in the rule or in the guidance to the rule, so this is the closest thing we've got to guidance to inspectors as well. And there is that old Fairfax memo that on safety incentive programs, there's a uh, and we can give this to you guys um, through Stephanie, but there are a couple of, uh, there's at least one important safety incentive related memo that Rich Fairfax, when he was still the Director of Enforcement, issued that I think is folded into this, um, the, you know, this new rule. And that was, that was about VPP generally that you cannot know? There were two. There okay. was one about VPP and then there was one general one about safety incentive program. Okay. Okay, we have time for one more question. Um, the last question that we received, what if we're a union facility and work rules allow drug testing on accident? So the CBA includes provisions that allow for post-incident drug test, a blanket post-incident drug testing. I don't think that is a, I don't think that would excuse the implementation of this rule. There are a few categories of um, you know, requirements, you know, you're required under certain other uh, enforcement schemes or regulatory schemes that would excuse this, but the CBA is not one of them. Uh, it would be, you know, if your workers' comp requires it or you are participating in a program, 
that workers' comp gives you a benefit for doing it, or if there's another regulator that requires it, or if state law in your state requires it. But I don't think a employment contract or a collective bargaining agreement that allows it would would, would excuse what OSHA perceives as retaliatory intent. Right, because that's not a regulatory or legal requirement. It's a negotiated contract requirement. Now, I will say, though, that in terms of likelihood of enforcement, the agency is much less likely to, you know, get all worked up and bring an enforcement action where they know that the union has agreed to it in a collective bargaining agreement. But that's just important. That's, you know, the agency will use its enforcement discretion. But legally and technically, uh, may use its enforcement discretion. Legally and technically, though, um, that would not be a defense to uh, to an otherwise illegal policy. Okay, that concludes today's webinar. Uh, thank you to all of our attendees. You will be receiving a recorded version of this webinar along with a copy of the slides. You'll see on your screen now we have the contact information displayed for both of our presenters. Feel free to contact them directly with any of your other questions that we might not have gotten to today. So thank you again and have a good rest of your day. Thanks everyone. Enjoyed this. Yeah, thank you very much.